The AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click Donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. The Supreme Court takes up the outrageous gerrymandering of the Wisconsin legislature. Professor Emily Bazelon explains the issue. Political strategist Jim Zogby says Democrats must recapture the votes of the age-old coalition that used to vote for them. And Jason Dick of Roll Call discusses the prospects for gun safety legislation. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Legal analyst Emily Bazelon says Republican gerrymandering is so bad it would require a Democratic voting margin of 7% nationwide to break even in House races. And we say hello to Emily Bazelon, staff, staff writer at the New York Times Magazine, Truman Capote Fellow for Creative Writing and Law at Yale Law School, and also co-host of Slate's Political Gab Fest, a weekly podcast. Emily Bazelon, thanks so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Sure thing. Thanks for having me. It's our pleasure to have you with us. You know, among the many topics that you've written about lately is gerrymandering. Uh, The Supreme Court has taken up a case involving Wisconsin's legislative legislative districts. Do you have a sense of how this might turn out? I hate predicting Supreme Court (laughs) outcomes. It's thankless. Um, But I will say that um, we're talking after oral arguments before the court and Justice Kennedy, who seems surely like the swing vote in this case, was more receptive than a lot of people expected to the argument that courts should do something about partisan gerrymandering. So um, that kind of made the idea that um, there could be a way for courts to get involved, at least in extreme gerrymanders, and prevent them. That seems a little more hopeful after the argument. Mm hmm. Now, for some time, Democrats used similar tactics to ensure legislative majorities in state capitals and in Congress, but they weren't so open about it. Why did they ignore the very open campaign by Republicans starting in the 80s to flip state legislatures, pack minorities into a single district and pick pick and choose the voters they wanted? Well, you know, I think that what happened after 2010, really, is that Um, There were more state houses, more states where the government was controlled by one party, usually by the Republicans. And that's because the Republicans were very effective in 2010 in getting their um, legislators and governors elected. And so now you have a situation where Republicans are drawing more of the districting maps. You know, of course, the drawing happens after the census. And so whoever's in control um, every 10 years, um, this, in this case in 2011, has a lot of say. And so there are a couple of states, um, Maryland and Illinois, for example, where Democrats were in control. But in about 40 percent of um, the races in the congressional races across the country, it was Republicans who controlled the redistricting. Conservative or Republican views, it's always been that that drawing districts has has been a partisan matter and that the political process, not the court, is the place to remedy the situation. I can assume possibly that you disagree with that. Well, I mean, look, the Constitution says that the legislature has the power to draw the line. The question is whether courts have any role to play here. Um, And the argument in favor of courts playing a role is that they um, police uh, redistricting in other ways. You know, we have one person, one vote, which means that there'll be equal apportionment. And that's a rule that the Supreme Court created in the 1960s. And we also have a whole body of law about racial gerrymandering and what the limits for that is. And again, that's an interpretation of the Voting Rights Act and equal protection that comes from the courts. 
So there's an argument that partisan gerrymandering isn't that different, and courts do have a role to play. Um, If you don't like gerrymandering, you can also look to a different kind of solution, which is a nonpartisan or bipartisan commission. And that's something that voters can do themselves through a referendum. So, you know, there there are different ways to um, address this issue. Okay. Do you like the, the jungle primary? that California has adopted where the top two vote getters in a primary, regardless of party, go on to the general election? Well, I think what is um, interesting about what California is doing is that it suggests you have more competitive races, right? That um, in a state where one party is really dominant, you could have two candidates from that party and a, a race between two candidates who, as a result, have more support from the voters. There are other ways that are you know, other things that uh, um, states can do that are more um, radical, so we say, like you could have, have a system of multi-member districts where voters vote for a slate of people. And that would allow for a bigger shakeup in American politics. You could have party, um, you could have minority parties um, that could actually have some power and some representation. That's not something we really have any room for right now. Right. Well, let me ask you this, though. What I mean, when I made the reference to the what I refer to as jungle primary that California has uh, adopted, what's the difference between that system and the Southern runoff election system that tended to suppress representation of minorities? I mean, you can have that problem if you, you know, look, if you have a state where one party is dominant and that party doesn't have minority support, then something like California's primary system could lend itself to that. It really depends on what the composition of the voters is um, and their roles in the different parties. We're speaking with Emily Bazelon, staff writer at the New York Times Magazine, Truman Capote Fellow for Creative Writing and Law at the Yale Law School, and she is also co-host of Slate's Political Gab Fest weekly podcast, joining us today on our podcast, americasdemocrats.org. Emily, you have written or you, you wrote an acclaimed book, Sticks and Stones, about the dangers of cyberbullying. A tough fight, is it not, when the biggest cyberbully is the President of the United States? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so President Trump's, um, uh, some of what he does, particularly on Twitter, when he goes after people individually, um, is kind of classic bullying behavior. He's the dominant person with more power. Um, and he's making somebody famous or infamous by attacking them online. I do wonder about what kind of message kids are getting from that kind of behavior from a president. Well, and that's the concern. And so how how do parents confront this? Because this is new for a lot of people, not bullying, but cyberbullying. Right. I mean, I think parents have to work hard to instill values in kids, both to help make sure that their kids are not um, being cruel online and also to make sure that they're resilient if they face um, that kind of cruelty. And also that if they're not participating directly, but they see it happen, that that's something that they are willing to um, help look out for kids who are more vulnerable. So, you know, for parents, The whole online domain is tricky because you want to give your kids some amount of um, space to explore it, and it's really hard to control it, even if you don't want your kids to have the space to explore it. But I also think it's really important to try to talk to kids about um, what they're seeing and participating in. And personally, I think delaying access to social media and phones for kids, phones that access the Internet, is important. Here, here on that one. Um, and this also kind of then reaches into the territory, I would think, that, you know, back in the olden days, if you will, when a parent might be tempted to look at a kid's diary. And there was that, you know, you're, you don't trust me and that kind of thing. And you, you cause this whole friction in, in the family with that sort of, 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 of oversight, if you will, by the parent. I mean, it, that could be another problem that opens up with this. Right, except a diary is private. You're not writing to the entire world or your whole community with your diary, right? And the difference here is that what kids write online is often public. Um, It's like public from the point of view of the world that they live in. And so it can have different kinds of consequences. And that's why I think that 
parents need to um, figure out a way to give kids some privacy, but also set some limits and exercise some oversight. Okay, fair enough. Now, how should progressives and other people of goodwill fight the Trump disaster? Is it is it mass action, political organizing, lawsuits, perhaps impeachment? I mean, I'm a reporter, not an advocate, so I am not someone who's going to like tell other people um, what the resistance should consist of. You know, what I see around me are people using a variety of tactics to express themselves. And I think that um, however you feel about the Trump administration, this is a moment where it's acutely clear what the stakes are and what it means to participate in the American democracy. Um, You know, for better or worse, Trump is making national politics quite difficult to ignore. And to the extent that that galvanizes people, whatever their views, that could be um, a good thing for the health of the democracy. Mm, Agreed. Emily Bazelon, staff writer at The New York Times Magazine, co-host of Slate's Political Gab Fest, joining us today on americasdemocrats.org. Emily, we appreciate your time with us today. Look forward to having you back again soon. Thanks so much. You're quite welcome. And this is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this americasdemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on donate at the top of the page. Social security measure. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security, and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing, or one time, in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America, whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job. That's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Democratic campaign operative Jim Zogby says the party's candidates must engage in personal contact with voters and the dull nuts and bolts of political organizing. We'll talk to him more about that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. The self-described geniuses of Wall Street are being stupid again. In 2007, their stupid schemes and frauds crashed our economy, destroying middle-class jobs, wealth, and opportunities. Far from being punished, however, the scoff laws were bailed out by their Washington enablers. So the moral lesson they learned was clear. Stupid pays. Go stupid. Sure enough, here they come again. Rather than investing America's capital in real businesses to generate grassroots jobs and shared prosperity, Wall Street is siphoning billions of investment dollars into speculative nonsense, such as bundles of high-risk subprime auto loans. It works like this. Car dealers, eager to goose up sales, hawk new vehicles to lower-income people, offering quick loan approval even to those with poor credit ratings. Banks, eager to hook more people on monthly car payments, okay these subprime car loans without verifying the buyer's ability to pay. Then, a Wall Street bank's investment house buys up thousands of these iffy individual loans, bundles them into multi-million dollar debt securities, and sells them to wealthy global speculators. Last year alone, banks sold $26 billion worth of these explosive bundles of car loans. This is a gaseous repeat of Wall Street's subprime mortgage bubble that burst a decade ago. The scam generates easy money at the start for speculators and banksters, 
But as more and more low-income buyers are unable to make their car payments, defaults build up, and the whole financial bubble pops. This is Jim Hightower saying, wasting America's much-needed investment capital on a scheme that intentionally puts people in cars they can't afford with loans they can't repay is not only stupid, but immoral, and it's killing our economy. Why are we letting elite Wall Street loan sharks do this to us? Hightower's commentaries are brought to you by the Hightower Lowdown, the monthly newsletter with Hightower's take on what Wall Street and Washington are up to. For information, visit HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Nuts and bolts organizing is the key for progressives to turn the country around, says campaign operative Jim Zogby. And we say hello to James Zogby, co-founder of the American Arab Institute in 1985, continues to serve as its president, also a member of the executive committee of the Democratic National Committee, and was twice appointed by President Obama to the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. James Zogby, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're quite welcome, and it's our pleasure to have you with us. And I'll start by mentioning that you were good friends with the late Fred Rodondaro, who happens to have been our most frequent guest on this podcast. Mm -hmm. How did you come to know him, and and what advice did he give you over the years? I first met Fred in the 70s. Um, I had been invited to an ethnic leaders meeting with Vice President Mondale, um, and Three days after the meeting, I was called by somebody at the White House saying, we loved having you, but, you know, we got complaints. There was an Arab at the meeting and uh, uh, who supported the the Palestinians, and we we just can't have you back again. So um, uh, I had gotten to know Fred a little bit at the lead up to the meeting and then during the meeting, and he was pretty outraged uh, that that had happened. And uh, sort of took me under his wing, um, invited me to a whole bunch of things he was doing. And I kind of marveled at his ability to convene uh, people, really interesting people uh, around Washington, writers, uh, people in politics, um, and uh, and in the arts. And I you know, would be a sort of a silent partner in the beginning at lunches that he would invite me to when I'd, I'd meet some of these really wonderful folks. And he invited me to a an event he did for the Italian-American congressional delegation. I went thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to go to something with like 500 people and members of Congress just sort of passing through. And it was an event of about 50 people. 30 of them were members of Congress, and, and I was there. And it was kind of funny because Fred knew that I was the Arab American and that there were some folks who was like, oh, my God, you know, it's one of them. But, uh, but you know, when I was with Fred, it was like he was, I was a friend of his, and he, was, he, he did not see this as something that, uh, that he would uh, ever want to, to, to be used against me. Even when they started an ethnic coalition in Washington, uh, Gino Pellucci had started it uh, and asked Fred to bring people together. They did a whole thing on, on uh, negative stereotyping in the media, and Fred asked me to chair the session. Well, some Jewish groups complained, how are you having an Arab guy do it, and you know uh, that they have an, a, a hidden agenda in everything they do. And Fred told them, the hell with it. You know, he's going to do it, and, and stood by me. And so it was that sense of, of always standing by me, always inviting me in, always making me feel that he was judging me by qualities that he saw in me, not by my ethnicity, that made me feel, you know, very empowered. Um, and um, uh, I remember people would ask me uh, when we started the different groups that I started after that, uh, are you trying to mimic what the Jewish community did? And I said, I'd say, no, I'm trying to mimic what the, the Italian community did. I, I, was, I was so impressed by Fred's ability to convene, to network, to lend support, uh, it didn't matter what party folks were from. If they were Italian-American and they needed help, Fred was going to help them. And so we've tried to model that with the institute that I do, um, where you know young Arab-Americans running for office, we try to help them. We try to give them support and uh, help you know give them uh, financial assistance and connect them with people in their areas we know who are donors. Folks who want a job at the White House, uh, we've been able to, you know, uh, 
take their recommend their 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 references and their letters and lobby for them to get positions. We've tried to do what the Italian American community has done, in other words, which is support folks in our community and give them a a, a bit of a, um, a, a a helping hand when they would maybe need one. And uh, uh, lesson I'll never forget. And Fred was a, a great mentor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I, it was a wonderful description, and I loved hearing the story because that, that just that sounds like the person that we knew over the years on this program. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Washington is full of interest and advocacy groups. How do you assess the relative value of money versus the nuts and bolts of political organizing? I, I actually think that the nuts and bolts of political organizing can can be more effective. But I think that most people in Washington assume that money is more important, and so they place more emphasis on it than they do on on nuts and bolts. And as as uh, someone who's run up against this uh, in a lot of my life, um, I've uh, you know I, I can tell you that um, uh, look look at Bernie Sanders' campaign. Um, he did not do what politicians normally do, did not go after big money, did not do that kind of stuff. I mean, his his famous fundraiser after Iowa was to announce his website, and he brought it in. And the rest of the campaign was pure nuts and bolts organizing. Um, When he raised the Israeli-Palestinian issue, there were those who said, oh, he's dead now, you know, he'll never get the money, he'll never... But he he knew uh, that that didn't matter. What mattered is that he was honest, that people were going to believe in him, um, and that he wasn't going to go back on his word. And the money came in and continued to come in in the organizing. He inspired a generation of people, many of whom had not been involved in politics before, uh, to take him seriously. I believe that that can work. I believe that, that enthusiasm and organizing, when you channel that enthusiasm and give it political direction, it can make a huge difference. But I think that right now we're still fighting that fight uh, with a lot of folks who think uh, it's better to get a check for a, 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 a pack that you start um, or a, a, you know, a, a one of these non-affiliated uh, 501c4s or whatever that gets a, a $500,000 check from somebody and spends an independent expenditure. That's more important than, than actually mobilizing people. Um, Campaigning has become, um, most people, the only thing they hear from the Democratic Party is they get a fundraising email or a fundraising hard mail or a fundraising phone call. Uh, I don't think that that ultimately works. I think that that's one of the reasons why we're losing support. That's one of the reasons why over 50% of millennials don't identify with any party, uh, because it it simply doesn't matter. It's a whole bunch of spam to them. They make their choices on other things other than the quote-unquote messaging, poll-tested messaging from consultants who get paid way too much money uh, to provide that kind of information. And so I do think at the end of the day, personal contact, direct um, nuts and bolts organizing is the most important thing. But right now, that's not what's happening. That's not what people in the establishments of both parties happen to believe. We're speaking with James Zogby, co-founder and president of the Arab American Institute, also a member of the executive committee of the Democratic National Committee. Jim, do you have working relationships with other ethnic, religious, and and national groups? And and, and talk, if you will, about the importance of working together, even with Jewish organizations, after Charlottesville. Oh, look, uh, we... uh, on many levels, we have we have cooperative relationships on on issues, for example, uh, immigration, we belong to coalitions on Islamophobia. We belong to coalitions on the Middle East. We work with a number of groups, um, uh, most especially progressive groups in the Jewish community, um, whose views on this issue are identical to ours. Um, and, uh, and, and in fact, uh, I think that were it not for groups like American Friends of Peace Now or J Street or Jewish Voice for Peace, some of the opportunities that we now have to raise these issues wouldn't be there. Um, and then uh, in the Democratic Party, I, one of the co-founders of the 
National Democratic Ethnic Coordinating Council, uh, which is the council that was formed of the European and Mediterranean ethnic groups, uh, to give them a voice. Because, look, when I grew up, the Democratic Party was an ethnic party. Um, in Utica, New York, where my hometown, uh, there was the, the, the Irish, the Polish, the Italian, uh, and the Lebanese formed the, the backbone of the Democratic Party. Um, that's all changed. Uh, we've lost those communities, and even the new immigrants among those communities don't identify as Democrats, basically because we stopped talking to them. I mean, people give you all kinds of other reasons. Well, they got more affluent and they dropped out, or they were racist and they dropped out, or they were this and they dropped out. One of the big reasons why is because Democrats stopped talking to them, stopped talking to them directly. Uh, when we talk to them directly, when Joe Biden goes to Scranton, they turn out. But when you don't go and speak to them in the language that they understand, they don't turn out. When Bernie Sanders went to West Virginia, he won that vote. You don't go there and don't talk to them. You don't win their vote. You don't win their trust. And so our ethnic council has is, is been pressing within the Democratic Party um, to, in fact, don't write us out. Don't write out the Italian, the Irish, the Polish uh, the Eastern, Central European, and Mediterranean communities, uh, consider us part of the, the the historic base that can still be won back to the Democratic Party. They don't do it. I mean, they don't hire us. They haven't had a staff person now in years that does this kind of outreach. They've got staff people for everything else you can possibly imagine. But we're having a hard time convincing them of the need to hire somebody to do ethnic outreach, which means... Basically, not it's not an identity politics game. It's a simple branding game. It's being able to go to the Polish press with stories that say why Polish Americans ought to vote for Democrats, who are famous Polish American Democrats, and, and what do they say about the importance of this election. It's just a question of calling out the name, of giving groups recognition, of letting them know that you're there for them, that the party represents everybody, not just some of the groups that they are uh, currently uh, that identify they identify as the base vote. I think our base vote uh, ought to be everybody in America. Our message ought to be directed to everybody in America, and that was a lesson I learned um, early on in, in in politics. And just just a little story, if I could. Um, in Please. 1984, Fred invited me to Italian American Foundation dinner. And Reagan and Mondale were both going to be there. Mondale got up and got seven applause lines when he said Geraldine Ferraro's name. That was it. And the rest of it was this litany of causes and support. I support the unions. I supported this. I supported that. Reagan got up and said, my grandmother, like yours, came to this country with nothing but her hopes and dreams. She worked her fingers to the bone in the belief that someday one of her descendants uh, would benefit from everything she did. I stand before you, the beneficiary of her hard work, the inheritor of her dreams. There wasn't a dry eye in the room. He knew how to talk to people, and he knew how to sh that he shared. He was able to convince them he shared their values. Uh, Mondale, who would have had a more compelling story to tell because of his ethnic roots, didn't get that, and so lost that vote. Um, and that was what convinced me that we needed this ethnic council that we have in the Democratic Party that night. I said, that's the speech Democrats always gave, but we stopped giving that speech. And, and so, look, I believe that the party must recapture that vote. But as long as we don't, as long as we consider it wasting money to go after that vote, we're going to be losing elections. We're going to lose in, in Ohio and Wisconsin and Michigan and and, and lose legislative seats in Pennsylvania. And that's something we shouldn't do. And so that's been a, 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 a big campaign of mine is get us back to the constituencies that we lost and that we need to win back. And don't view it as either or. It's not. It's got to be both. Absolutely. Uh, now, before we let you go, I want to kind of turn to specifics. How does the Trump anti-immigration policy affect Arab Americans as opposed to, or perhaps like, how it affects Latin Americans? Well, look, when you have immigration, uh, you're going to affect everybody. Um, when you deal with the, you cut those numbers in half and you're going to be screwing people. 
when you do the the Muslim ban um, and and target folks from Syria and and Iraq and and Yemen, those are emerging communities in the Arab community. I mean, we we you know we've always had historically a very large Syrian community throughout the South. There's lots of folks who identify as Syrian American. Um, when you say to them, no more, uh, especially now in the middle of this war, when you've got refugees who are vetted uh, by reputable international agencies, vetted by our own uh, homeland security folks, and you're saying to them, no, you can't come, doing the same with Iraqis who've been vetted, Yemenis who've been vetted, uh, that's a horrible, having a horrible impact. Uh, plus, get, doing away with the lottery system. Um, there are groups that never got included in the quota system from North Africa. So we have today, uh, um, uh, since the 90s, uh, a Moroccan, Tunisian, um, Algerian, uh, Mauritanian uh, communities that have sprung up and, and we're doing away with them because we're saying no more lottery. Uh, they're the only way they were able to come was through the lottery because they weren't in the quota system. So, I look, this is having a, a, a detrimental impact, impact on the community, on families, on the ability for folks to bring their loved ones over. Uh, you say to folks, you can't bring your grandmother, uh, you can't bring your fiancé, that's, that's having an impact. So it's affecting us all, not just the Latinos, but it's affecting every community, affecting Africans. Um, and, um, you know, you cut the numbers in half, you affect everybody at the end of the day. Absolutely. James Ogby, co-founder and president of the Arab American Institute, member of the executive committee of the Democratic National Committee, joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Jim, thank you so much for your time. We do look forward to having you back again with us soon. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. You as well. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. <laughs> We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press talks with Roll Call's Jason Dick about the Las Vegas shootings. You know, p- pivoting to Las Vegas a little bit, one thing I, I was, you know, struck by a little bit yesterday was in the, in the leadership's, you know, press conferences, both sides kind of went to their respective corners. Republicans talking about mental health, mm-hmm. Democrats talking about background checks. And one of the things that the that uh, Paul Ryan left out when he talked about the mental health bill that they passed last year that was folded into a, a larger bill, the 21st Century Cures Act, you know, which, you know, among other things, created a mental health assistant secretary at HHS and some things like that. Some, some you know, good good things for, for mental health. What, the, what he didn't mention is that they also, in February, overturned an Obama-era rule that allowed mentally, you know, that, that, that made it diff- diff- more difficult for mentally disabled people to acquire guns. Uh, that, that was left off of the list of, of major actions uh, by, by Congress on, on guns. And it, it just seems like that, I mean, it, we're, we're as guilty of this, you know, sometimes in the media as, as like sort of losing track of what happened in, you know, just even a week ago. February seems like a long time ago, but it's worth pointing that out. That No, it is. You know, because, I mean, the, because, and the silencer legislation. You know, I was the, just going to get to that. But on the, the mental health, it just contradicts what he was saying. First of all, mental health is, you're, you're right, that's their escape hatch. They always go there, right? Just like they always go to a moment of silence. They're the two things you can count on, and that's all they'll do, Right. Right. And yet, on, even on mental health, okay, sure, we don't want people who are mentally ill, known mentally ill, have men, going out and being able to buy a semi-assault weapon or any gun at all. But they themselves had just made it easier for that to happen. Right. And, and they didn't and even mention that yesterday. It, it, it is, I mean, it, it is sort of striking. And also, I, I don't think that, you know, the, I think we're going to see this play out a little bit differently. I mean, our, our, uh, our, our friend and colleague, Matt Laszlo, uh, talked to Pat Toomey yesterday, and 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 he's you know he asked Toomey, are you interested? This is the Republican senator from Pennsylvania. Are you interested in reviving your legislation on on universal background checks? And Toomey, without equivocation, said absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and, and I mean, so this is this is not um, 
I mean, the leadership, obviously, they want to talk about tax reform. Boy, they, it doesn't matter if, if like there's a meteorite heading toward, heading towards the earth. They want to talk about tax reform <laughs> uh, and, and they're going to mark up their budget resolutions and they're going to get this ball rolling. But, you know, when when people like Jimmy Kimmel, again, you know, is is talking about this on late night, people wake up with the Vegas stuff. They're going to bed with the Vegas stuff. They're kind of reeling. Uh, nobody really wants to talk about tax reform. They want to talk about about wow, this is happening again. To show you how um, clueless I think these people can be or the leadership can be, Mitch McConnell yesterday uh, again the classic defense uh, or, or for the uh, response on the part of the, the Republicans whenever there's a gun mass shooting, which is like every day. Here's Mitch McConnell yesterday. I think it's particularly inappropriate to politicize an event like this. Oh, it just yes. happened within the last day and a half. It's entirely premature to be discussing about legislative solutions, if any. Oh, so inappropriate, right? Clutching, so clutching the insensitive. What, what's am- amazing about this, too, is that on Monday, Such during a- during his leadership remarks, you know, on, on, on Monday in the, mm-hmm. in the afternoon, I mean, you actually saw some... Truly, I, I think genuine emotion. I mean, for, coming from Mitch McConnell talking about this, uh, and 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 then to just kind of revert back to the standard, you know, you know, go up in front of the press and and give the standard answer that everybody's waiting for, uh, that that's inappropriate. And I, I mean, on a very broad level, aside from just the the policy or politics and how you may lean or not, this the Congress represents the people of the United States. If if a congressman wants to talk about this because he feels like it's in the interest of his district or the people he represents. That is his or her right and, and duty, really, as as a member yeah, of Congress. Yeah. The, these people represent the American public. The American public is obviously <laughs> wants to talk about this. Some people want to talk about policy solutions. Some people want to grieve. Some people want, there's a there's a wide variety. But just sort of universally shutting it down and saying like this isn't the time to talk about actual things we can do is. I mean, it, it's it's sort of brushing aside a wide swath of the American public. There are also some in s- s- cases where it's so outrageous that you cannot avoid it. And it seems to me when this guy has 42 guns, right, most of them semi-automatic rifles, 12 of them with these bumps to turn them into machine guns, and he's got 23 of them in his hotel room, you you have to and plus a mountain of ammunition. You've got to say, is this really what the Second Amendment is all about? I, I'm reminded of the the Onion headline from uh, 2014, which says, "No way to prevent this." Says only nation where this regularly happens, <laughs> and 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 again, that's from that's from over three years ago, and like, yeah. Since that time, we have had two oh. more of the most deadliest of the deadliest shootings in American history happen: the Pulse nightclub uh, last year, and then this uh, in Las Vegas. A- and like, we haven't seen any movement, no. like at all. Movement, no. no, like nothing, no nothing. Right. Well, actually, we do. We have made it easier for mentally disabled people. To be okay, I should, I should, I should, I should have been my comments. We have had some movement in the that's wrong my, direction. That's, that's the, my data point I wanted to bring in <laughs> today. I'm gonna keep hitting okay. it. <laughs> all right, so. So, uh, since that bill, right, the, the 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 bill now, which has been twice delayed, is the silencer bill, right, right, which um, it's all about hunters' hearing, you know, it, it, it's, yeah, it's it's to protect right. the hearing for for hunters. It would also make it easier to uh, buy armor piercing bullets, yes, <laughs> and to carry uh, guns and, across and, state lines, right, right. So so this was scheduled. Why? This was scheduled Why? for a vote, scheduled for a vote the day of the shooting. Uh, at the ball field in Alexandria, where where uh, Whip Steve Scalise was, you were here that day. Uh, yes, that's right. That that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So they had to delay the vote that day. It was a little, but <clears throat> a little insensitive then to vote on. So it was scheduled for yesterday too for a hearing, uh, for a vote. And it just sort of, uh, you know, went away. It was it just sort of disappeared, you know. And and Paul it, Ryan it, now says there are no plans to bring that bill up. But it doesn't mean they're dropping it. No. Right, yeah. They'll I mean, try to slip it through. Yeah, it's, it's sort of a yet, you know, sort, sort of thing. And, I mean, granted, it, it's unclear whether this could even, you know, even the, the Senate would go even nearer, you know, legislation like this. But it does, you know, it, it just, it seems like 
this is where the incongruity comes in, <laughs> you know, of, of just not being able to let some of these things go. And I, you know, I was struck by the, you know, when you're sort of like listing all the stuff of 42 guns and, you know, all these bump stocks and the ammunition and so forth. Just think about the sheer logistics. I mean, you know, like, I mean, Peter, when you when you get travel on a plane with your kids, like how how difficult is that just to get just yeah. to get everybody's luggage? Right. You know, right, like, and, right, and, right. and that's like 10 percent of the of the luggage that this guy like trucked into the Mandalay Bay. Um, you know, it, hotel, and it, it, it's just sort of staggering that. Plus you know, the cameras that he set up, right? Yeah. Uh, in the hallway, in the in the room at the door, and everything right. to be able to track where the law right. enforcement was coming through. I mean, this I, guy was a master planner, right? And Diabolical I, I, right. master. I, planner. I feel like, yeah, I still owe you know, like if I eat a candy bar in some of these mm-hmm. hotels, you know, they will track you to the ends oh, yeah. of the earth. <laughs> but but this guy was setting up a sniper's den. Um, in a in you know one of the nicest and most secure one of the most popular places. hotels in Vegas, one of the more secure places yeah. uh, in in, uh, in in Las Vegas. It's it's a little chilling. Yeah, indeed. Um, so, but it was good to see. I mean, I thought I think you're right. There may be, may 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 be some bipartisan effort here. For Joe Manchin and a Pat Toomey and um, and you know, not just the Chris Murphy. Although I'm not taking anything away from right. him, but He's been there really solid. Maybe they can get some action. Maybe there'll be enough public outrage. Here's the problem. Um, what's his name? Stephen Paddock, right? Yeah. Uh, as Tom Friedman makes this morning, if only he had been a Muslim, we'd see some action. Uh, and uh, it's something that even before Friedman made the point, Jimmy Kimmel made uh, on his show. That, Did he? You know, he's, yeah. He, he, he made, you know, Kimmel. This this hits very hard, you know, because he's from Vegas. From yeah. Vegas. Uh, and and said, mm-hmm. and again, I'm not trying to <laughs> elevate Jimmy Kimmel to the point of no, political but saint, is, but he's he's, you know, he, he's risen I, to I, the yeah, he's tapped into right. something. He, he has pointed tapped yeah, into something. He, he pointed out that you know people say that we can't do anything about this, but you know, he, and he very you know in a, in his good comic timing said, you know, anytime somebody with a beard attacks us. We pass laws. We make it more difficult to travel. We have to pass right. through another layer of security in airports. I mean that, and that happens quickly. Yes, that happens very. Oh yeah, quickly. they would have had. There would be congressional hearings today, if not yesterday, all about how did this Muslim get these guns? How did he get to Las Vegas? What kind of a travel ban? You know what? And what extra measures were going to? They would be all over it, and Donald Trump would be tweeting the hell out of it. I told you so, right? Instead, what Donald Trump said about Las Vegas, he said, quote, what happened is, in many ways, a miracle, a miracle. I don't I'm not a religious man. (laughs) I don't know what he thinks a miracle looks like, but this ain't it. Well, he 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 amended his comments. He tweeted yesterday to sort of clarify because he was getting a lot of grief for it. He said on Twitter uh, it is a, quote, miracle how fast the Las Vegas yeah. Metropolitan Police were able to find the demented shooter and stop him from even more killing. But, uh, that's not what happened. I mean, it's not like the police found him and stopped him. The crowd dispersed, and the guy had no more targets, and the police found him, like, 74 minutes after the shooting started, which, like, look, I get that it's a it's a, it's a a tough situation to find the guy. I'm not giving the police department any grief, but let's not say – that this was an was act not, of heroism it, that stopped this guy from doing it. He had right. free reign it to was, shoot whoever he wanted until the crowd realized what was happening and they got away. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and again, not being critical of the police department, it was no. an impossible situation. Sure. Because he was way up there. They didn't know what floor. Yeah. They couldn't get to him, the whole thing. But it was not an immediate stepping in and stopping him in the act of shooting. It no, sure as hell no. wasn't a miracle. No. But you know what the miracle comment to me was? It's it's the echo of what he said in Puerto Rico about, hey, only 16 died, you know, yeah. in, in Vegas. Only 59 died. Right? Only the worst shooting in American history happened. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it, it's, it, is, it is kind of, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to get into you know trouble here, but it it, it just go ahead. <laughs> it just seems <laughs> we get I in mean, trouble every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's just us. Uh, it, I mean, yeah. it, it it does seem though that like the it, it's hard to imagine another president saying this. I mean, it's hard to oh, imagine. Man. It's hard to imagine. Like say say if John McCain was president, you know, and and no, you know no. somebody who saw combat and was tortured for six years, you know, as a prisoner of war and so forth. It's really hard for for to imagine him. Saying something like that, it's really difficult to imagine Mitt Romney saying something like this. I mean, like go through the list of like, you know, 
recent Republicans who could have been president. It's hard to imagine. I mean, anybody, any of the 17 other people he be, he beat in the, in the Republican primary saying this, uh, even some of the weakest, you know, like candidates there or the or some of the most, you know, clueless ones uh, in, in the Republican primary. But, you know, you, you can't. I mean, Jeb Bush, Ted Cruz, Scott Walker, Ben Carson, like Rand Paul, like nobody would say things like that. It's you know? nonsensical for anybody else to say it. But for Trump, I, I want to go a step further. Uh, we've been there nine months now. It's hard for me still to imagine that he's president of the United States. I mean, seriously. I mean, the guy is so, uh, you know, I like out of control, outrageous, the things that he says and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the tweets, you know, nonstop, right? Um, and, but I don't know. Mm. We're stuck with it for how long, Jason? Uh, that That's a, a, <laughs> a, a good question. I really, I mean, I can't imagine, I can't imagine it, you know, going on much longer, but I also cannot imagine any kind of impeachment proceedings starting under Republican control. Um, I, I keep mean, telling it, all my friends, Stop this pipe dream about impeachment. Right. It's not going to happen. It's, it's not yeah. going to happen. And right. stop this pipe dream about he's going to get tired of the job and retire. Right. Are you kidding? He is in his glory, right? right? He's got all this attention. You know, he's, he's, he's relevant. And he's making all this yeah. money, making yeah. more money he ever made probably because, you know, his I, ho- from his hotels and I'm, everything. I'm curious to see where, when the stop uh, at, the, at the Trump uh, Hotel in Vegas will be. Or at, what, at what point? At what point will he? If if he goes, you know, I mean, because there was this thing well, of you know, it's he, totally he was, other end of the strip. Of course, it's not that far away. It's about yeah, a, no, it's about it, a mile. Mandalay so Bay. Away. Mandalay yeah. Bay's down at this end. Mandalay and the Trump Bay's, Tower is yeah. way way up right. at that. For it's, us, it's, it's, it's a up, hike. It, for it's up by their presidential it, it, motorcade. He'll right. get there. It's up there by Circus Circus. He'll get yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He'll get there. I know right where it is. Right. He'll get there. Yeah, and he doesn't have to. Yeah, he doesn't have to sit in traffic. This would have never happened. For this, this would have never happened at the Trump Hotel. That's going to be the statement he makes. This would have never happened at my hotel. You know what's interesting about the Trump a Tower in, uh, in in Vegas? No casino. Exactly. Why? Oh, that's right. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because the gaming co- commission uh, did not did not yeah. sign off on the license application. Would not give Donald Trump a license for for whatever reason. <laughs> um, there was. Well, I'd love to speculate on what that reason could be. <laughs> uh, and but and you know the, the uh, it's the only hotel. I, I I say that without checking every single one, but I've been to Vegas a lot. I'll be there tomorrow. Um, again, uh, it it's the only one that I know of, certainly that does not have a casino. I it's it's hard to find a place. It's hard yeah, to find a, a couple it's hard, now. It's hard to find now. a convenience store in Vegas. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> it's hard to find a gas station you know, that where you have, can't like put a, you know. That doesn't have slot machine. You get off the plane at McCarran, yeah. and you know you yeah. got a slot machine right there. The first you know, like, thing you see when you get off a plane yeah. in, in Las Vegas are the slot machines right in the waiting area. It's his. And you know, I I, I love. You they know, don't have I, a red carpet room in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> they, they've got they've got the craps table. <laughs> yeah, it, it is it is pretty phenomenal. Uh, I mean, like for as much as you know, as as weird a place as Vegas is, that's that's one of those like even weirder like <laughs> statements. You know that that Vegas is the one place that you know Trump couldn't get a casino approved. Mm-hmm. I think it says a lot about what they know about what happened in Atlantic City, and maybe. Some of the people he was he was doing business with in Atlantic City, um, uh, because um, I mean I'm not saying Vegas is still Sin City, but they have really cracked down on certain elements that it, we associated it, with it, gambling. Yeah, it is a different place than than my grandfather went to work at, and when he went to the work to the Sands uh, in the, in the 1960s. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> a, 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 a story for another time. Uh, uh, but yes, it is a different place than 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 that, uh, and it is it is corporatized, and and they're they're well aware that the eyes of the nation go there to to play in in one way or another whether they're kids or whether they're you know kind of perverts i mean everybody's everybody's welcome and it it just has to be safe right. and right now it's not safe that's all for americasdemocrats.org thank you to all who made today's show possible emily bazelon jim zogby and the entire bill press team and thank you for listening if you liked what you heard please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots go to americasdemocrats.org and click on donate at the top of the page and be sure to find 21st century democrats on facebook For AmericasDemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. 
We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.